Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing the pathogenesis of uh, atherosclerosis. Okay, so we've seen so far that what happens is initially some sort of damage occurs to the endothelial cells. That causes these endothelial cells to put on their surface this protein VCAM1, standing for Vascular Cell Adhesion Molecule 1. The monocytes, which are circulating in the bloodstream, they have a complementary protein to VCAM1, known as VNA4, which stands for Very Late Antigen 4. Now, what will happen is the VNA4 on the monocyte will bind to the VCAM1 on the endothelial cell, and that will adhere the monocyte to the endothelial cell. That monocyte will then diapadese, as it's called, uh, across uh, the... Um, junction between two endothelial cells and then move across the basement membrane into the sub-endothelial space. Now, what's going to happen next? Well, basically, what's going to happen is these endothelial cells, you remember I told you that they, when they get damaged, they don't just put VCAM1 on their surface, they also do more. And they're going to release a protein known as MCSF1. Um, Oh, sorry, no, MCSF, but then CSF1, okay? So what colour should I draw this in? Okay, so this has two names. So this is this pink protein here, okay? And it has two names. It can either be referred to as MCSF, MCSF, and I'll tell you what these stand for in a moment, or it can be referred to as CSF1. Okay, now let me tell you what those stand for. So MCSF... MCSF stands for monocyte, monocyte, or macrophage, slash macrophage, okay, colony stimulating factor. Okay, so this is colony stimulating factor. Okay, and then CSF1, hopefully you can guess what that stands for, CSF1. One just stands for colony stimulating factor one. Okay, so we get the message. It's a colony stimulating factor, and it's going to stimulate macrophages or monocytes. And uh, it was the first colony stimulating factor to be found, or maybe the most important, and therefore it's also called colony stimulating factor one. Right now, what does this do? Well, one thing is it's not just going to go into the subendothelial space, it's also going to be released into the bloodstream. And what it will do is it will go to the bone marrow, to the cells in the bone marrow which produce monocytes and cause them to produce more monocytes, basically. So it's activating the production of monocytes. But in addition, it also has another role. It has the role of turning monocytes which have moved out of the bloodstream into macrophages. So what it's going to do is it's going to work on this monocyte here that has moved into the subendothelial space and it's going to cause it to become a macrophage. Now how shall I draw the macrophage different? I'll draw the macrophage as a sort of blob here. Okay, to show that it's slightly different at least from the monocyte. I'll draw it in a different colour. There's a solution. Uh, what colour should I draw on the macrophage? I'll draw him in orange. So this monocyte has now been stimulated to differentiate into a macrophage. So in orange here, we have a macrophage. So this is a macrophage. Okay, now what do macrophages do? Well, their main role is as a phagocyte. They um, basically engulf path pathogens and break them down, basically. But there are no pathogens here. But the macrophage isn't just going to call it a day because there's nothing wrong. It's still going to uh, carry out other roles. Yes, it's not going to be able to phagocytose things, uh, but it has other functions as well. It can also release a bunch of absolutely foul substances that are aimed at killing uh, pathogens, basically. Now, one of the foul substances, it re some su substances that these macrophages release is a molecule known as superoxide. So let me give you a little bit of insight into what superoxide is. Okay, so superoxide. So we all know what oxygen is. 
Oxygen is an element, but we also know, and this is one of those horrible things that chemists have come up with, oxygen is the name of an element, but it's also the name of a molecule. So there is the oxygen element, which is just one oxygen atom, and then there is the oxygen molecule, which is two oxygen atoms uh, bound together. When I say oxygen, I will mean uh, the oxygen molecule. Okay, so let's draw the dot cross diagram for this oxygen molecule and then try and understand what superoxide is. So this is the oxygen molecule here. Okay, right. So the dot cross diagram then for it. Each oxygen atom has uh, six electrons in its outer shell. Okay, so it needs to gain two more. The solution to this is for the oxygen atoms to share electrons, basically. So what happens is this oxygen atom here gives two electrons and shares them with this oxygen atom here. And this oxygen atom gives two at electrons and shares them with this atom here. So overall, they both share these four electrons, and that gives them the right number in their outer shells. Okay, so this oxygen will also have its other four electrons here, and so will this one. Okay, so overall, each oxygen atom now has uh, six outer shell electrons of its own, but because it's sharing these, it feels as though it has eight, and therefore it's very happy. Okay, so this is the origin of the double bond. So this is the oxygen molecule here. Now, what happens if we, uh, if we um, add another electron in? What happens if I fire another electron at this molecule? Well, basically, let's say we bring this other electron in here. One of the oxygen atoms is going to get this electron. So let's say it's this oxygen atom on the left here. Okay, so this oxygen atom on the left is going to gain another electron. Now, what it's going to do is it's going to cause one of these bonds to cleave. Okay, so what will happen is... If you think about what would happen if one of these bonds cleaves, so let's say this bond here cleaves, so there's now still one covalent bond between the two oxygen mo uh, atoms. And now, here are these two lone pairs that have come, so that I've had to move them down here to make the picture prettier, but uh, that's trivial. Okay, and here are the lone pairs of this oxygen atom. And then each of them have now got an unpaired electron. That's what would happen if you just broke one of these bonds. Now, of course, if you've just got a normal oxygen molecule, it's not just going to spontaneously break one of those bonds, because this is a highly unstable structure. And if it did just spontaneously break one of these bonds, it would instantly reform, basically, because of how unstable it is. But if we fire in an extra electron, what's going to happen is it's going to cause this bond to break because that extra electron will pair with one of these electrons here. So here is this extra electron now pairing with the lone, well, with the electron that was on its own on just one of the atoms. Okay, so one of the oxygen atoms is now perfectly happy. It's got all eight outer shell electrons. It's got a negative charge because it's gained this electron without gaining a positive charge. So it gives this oxygen atom here a negative charge, but it doesn't mind that. It's got its outer shell, uh, eight outer shell electrons. This oxygen atom on the other side, this has got an unpaired electron. This is far less happy with the um, negotiations here, with the outcome. Uh, it has an unpaired electron, an electron that's going to exist in an orbital on its own. That makes it extremely reactive. And chemical species which have unpaired electrons, they are, they are extremely reactive and they are known as free radicals. So any sort of chemical species that has an unpaired electron is known as a free radical. Okay, uh, so this chemical species is going to be extremely reactive. This is superoxide. So it's basically oxygen after you've shot in another electron. Okay, so superoxide. And the way you would denote it symbolically is it's still O2 because you've still got two oxygen uh, atoms bound together, but you'd put a negative charge up there to denote this negative charge on one of the at atoms, and you put a dot here to denote the free radical, uh, the unpaired electron on this oxygen atom. So that's how superoxide oops, is usually denoted, uh, dot O2 minus, like that. Okay, now macrophages, they produce this stuff. 
Why? Because it's extremely reactive. It will react with DNA, with proteins, with lipids, with pretty much any cell uh, molecule you can come up with. It will interact with it. It causes major problems to cells. If they have too much of this, it causes a uh, phenomenon known as oxidative stress, basically, within the cell. And it's very, very fatal for the cell if it gets too much superoxide. So what macrophages start doing, basically, is when they've been called into a site on the... Um, they have the understanding that there is a bacterial infection in this site, basically. They've been called in because there is something terribly wrong. So they start producing this poison, basically, this superoxide, and secreting it into the surroundings. And it's going to... Uh, in a pathological situation, it, when there actually is a bacterial infection, it will cause um, at least some sort of weakening, if not death, of the invading cells. So it's very helpful there. But in this case, there is no bacterial infection, so it's not going to be helpful here. So basically, you start producing this superoxide molecule. So these macrophages here are going to be producing our superoxide here, O2 minus with this dot here. Okay, now, what is superoxide going to do? Well, it's going to, um, it's going to oxidize something known as LDL, but we'll discuss that in the next video.